I think what's also interesting is particularly entertainment or music that becomes an area of identity conversation between Taiwan and China. Because China is so much larger than Taiwan, just the music market is so much larger. And so entertainers such as Wang Lihong, for example, will go to China and make their living there. And that affects the views that they uh, espouse. And then there's concern from some people that the next generation of young people, for example, will grow up in an environment in which just it's dominated by Chinese music, television, film. And so they'll always be thinking of China, the, the greater China, it's this bigger, better place because the production quality is usually higher. Brian Hu is the founder of New Bloom based in Taipei, Taiwan, and is also a DJ. He's going to be taking us on a journey of uh, Taiwanese culture and politics through five songs, which were released over the course of 2021. Brian, take us away. Yeah. So the first song is Sorry No Youth by Sorry Youth. Sorry Youth is one of the best known indie rock bands currently. Uh, they often sing in Taiwanese Hokkien. And so, yeah, we'll listen to the song and talk a bit about it after.
so Brian, what what's uh, what's remarkable about this band and uh, what they're all about? So I think uh, what's interesting about Star Youth is they're kind of a voice of the generation. Uh, this is the Russian generation that came of age around the time of the 2014 Sub Farm that involved the month-long occupation of the Italian legislature by student activists in protest of a trade deal with China. And so Star Youth is one of these bands that kind of played at every protest, and they've been at sort of every protest in the years since then. Uh, they're very closely tied to activists. Um, a lot of their songs kind of reflect how I think a lot of acts are thinking, feeling, a uh, sense of kind of disenfranchisement of being displaced, uh, trying to seek out, you know, just a place of belonging, um, et cetera. I mean, this is criticized. I think a lot of these kind of indie rock bands are very masculine. Um, the one that is probably the kind of flagship one is Fire X, which also sings the Tony song again and sang at Tsai when the Taiwanese president's inauguration, for example. Tsai rode to power after the Sun Farm. But Sorry Youth is kind of a bit more, more indie-ish, I guess, so they haven't become as close to political power. Um, the thing is that they actually don't produce that much songs, though. I think the uh, our members have other lives and are busy and now some of them have kids. And so kind of what this song is reflecting on is that maybe they're, not longer, they're no longer young people, despite youth being in, in the uh, name of the band. And so that's why it's called Sorry or No Youth, because the Sun Farm movement was after all seven years ago. Some of their songs are reflecting on uh, just for example, this, this young generation that had you know no job opportunities, uh, were facing low salaries, unaffordable real estate. Well, they've grown up and had kids, better for better or worse. So I think this is kind of reflecting on that. Can you talk a little bit about the the evolution of uh, indie music in Taiwan and how it's sort of uh, kind of ebbed and flows in in interests and bands over the years? Yeah, it's very interesting because I think there's a very solid kind of indie scene now. Uh, people that listen to bands, indie rock bands, there's so many that it's a, a subculture of such size, for example. They could see an entire dating app based on this app um, and the subculture. And there is actually such an app. And so I find that kind of remarkable. Um, <laughs> What's it called? It's called uh, Xingjiao. I forgot the English is um, Hardings. I think the Hardings is... Oh, Chinese is fine. Yeah, I think Hardings is something like that in English. Um, but then it's interesting that because then one of the functions of this is you can find friends to go to events with things like that. You know, people go to festivals, uh, venues, uh, they have their favorite bands, and people are sometimes very auditory of their favorite bands. But and there's many ways in which, I think particularly after 2014, you know, for example, views of young people shifted. Uh, before that, young people were seen as weak and soft, etc. But so there's a view of them as a generation that's willing to take risks to uh, secure their own futures. And in line with this shift in perception, you have the uh, much more attention being paid to indie rock from the mainstream in that sense. So there are much more uh, indie rock bands. Uh, I think that, for example, some bands are actually pretty mainstream, but they package themselves as indie. It's become this kind of aesthetic. And so indie is now mainstream in that sense. Um, at the same time, for example, I don't think the music industry is really large enough that people have bands where they can make their living off. Them. That's very, very rare unless you do actually break out to the mainstream in some form. And so I think that's one of the paradoxes that you have a lot of these people that are bands, but they also have day jobs and you know, they struggle with having kids now. Um, just historically, if you're serving in the military, that also disrupts your bands, for example, just the mandatory draft. And so a lot of bands dissolve. Um, yeah. So a lot of bands started, oh, 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 dissolve. Yes, because they're interrupted by so. the uh, military service. And so then now as this generation gets older, then you also have, for example, those people have kids and being too busy to record and release albums and that. And, you know, they talk about their fans too, because I think there are a lot of fans that just go to basically like every show, that sort of thing, and are know quite well the band members so that's that's one of those things um I can, I can imagine like that year and a half or so where taiwan had no covid and no one could leave oh. like did people get sick of seeing the same bands over and over again um was it kind of fun uh how, how, how what was the what was the live music scene like in that uh, in that time yeah so it's actually quite interesting because i think uh this affects some scenes that way because you do have uh for example bands just are local bands you can only have local bands so then that's a way to center local bands. You can only see live music from local bands now. Uh, for example, in the electronic music scene, then you only have local DJs. Uh, you don't have foreign DJs coming in. But I think then at the same time, uh, putting international artists in dialogue with Taiwanese artists can somebody be a real stimulus to the scene. And so this was something I was lacking the past two years, that you know you don't have artists coming in with different styles or different influences and uh, building ties with Taiwanese artists, for example, as much. And this was something that had been before Coke. And so I think then that whenever, I mean, particularly because I'm more into personally as a DJ into the electronic music scene, this is very interesting when an artist will come in and represent its own style that is not as present in Taiwan. And then that'll kind of influence people and people try to, you know, kind of change up their work, uh, perhaps being influenced by it, et cetera. Um, so as they build networks or ties with artists and so the collaboration will continue. That hasn't happened as much now. Um, it can still happen, but it's through the internet, for example. And so, you know, some of the MVs that you do see these days or some of the songs you see are still car productions 
However, um, just it is not, it's kind of different than in the past. Um, the other thing though is the indie scene, despite the fact that it is quote unquote the new mainstream, as I mentioned earlier, it's still quite small that there are only so many venues that exist in Taiwan. And so a band that has uh, foreign and become successful, for example, may have played at basically literally every venue in Taiwan. So, you know, that's another thing that's a little paradoxical. It's the indie scene is a, a strange kind of awkward position in which it's become much larger, but it's not large enough to sustain artists on their own. And there are only so many venues because it is difficult to run venues, uh, et cetera. I just think that there's only so much maxed out space in terms of doing venues, which are, are oftentimes not too legally supported. There's not a support from the government in terms of uh, the relevant laws or finances, et cetera. Um, you have neighbors complaining because of the noise, or they just see kids and they're scared, and, and that sort of thing. Sure. Let's let's come to our next song, Brian. Yeah. So the next song is uh, uh, Talakoa by Collage. And so this is a very late release because it's in December, uh, right before the year ends. And so that's a bit of a surprise. A nice surprise to have a release from them um, right before the year ended. And and what kind of music do they make? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so they're uh, more kind of indie rockish, but they incorporate a lot of influence. And I think that is quite interesting, just that. Um, they have linguistically, they have anything from Taiwanese Hokkien to Mandarin songs and also Japanese songs. Uh, some instrumentation too is is a uh, uh, citational in that sense, just quoting, quoting in some sense uh, other forms of music. And I think yeah, that that's reflective of in their band name of collage.
So I think uh, what's particularly interesting about collage is that, for example, the lead singer is Amis, uh, indigenous Amis. And so uh, she is very concerned with her heritage, uh, her master's thesis on the preservation of uh, indigenous culture, or more, more precisely, the curation of how indigenous culture was depicted during the Japanese colonial period. Uh, you know, as in terms of, for example, just depicting Japanese colonialism as a civilizing mission and indigenous customs as sort of backwards and in the past, but also representing sort of the prehistory of, let's say, Asia at a time in which Japan was on this, this project, this imperial project of conquest of forming the greater East Asia post prosperity theory. And, uh, and so this is quite interesting that way. I think that, uh, uh, the lead singers also express enthusiasm for Japanese culture in terms of, for example, uh, the costumes they were performing. Uh, or even the artwork of the album covers that is something that she draws herself, despite being so critical of, for example, Japanese colonials. I mean, being someone of Indian descent, that meant that your family was on the receiving end of the brutalities of Japanese colonialism. So I think what is interesting then about the band is that it reflects in many ways this kind of cultural pluralism that one sees in Taiwan uh, today, that just there are so many different influences kind of coming together and compressed together, oftentimes in this family background of somebody, uh, but also in these various cultural influences. But then you have all these different overlapping colonialisms uh, at the same time just all these ever considerable political viewpoints uh, sometimes for example being a indigenous person that is descended from a family that was uh, that went through the Japanese colonial period but also being interested in Japanese anime or Japanese culture or music and that sort of thing it's a tricky tangle of thorns to navigate mm-hmm. I imagine but also makes for cool music yeah absolutely it's quite interesting is seeing bands grapple with this because I think uh, particularly interesting is developments in indigenous music in the past few years as well Indigenous uh, musicians have traditionally been slotted or, or positioned as singer-songwriters, as folk. And I think this reflects views of indigenous music or of indigenous people that, you know, this is folk. It's kind of something of the past and their music is, is like that. And oftentimes it is, you know, singing uh, traditional melodies paired with guitar, for example. Uh, part of it also is influenced by just the 1960s and global folk uh, movement uh, in terms of just the interest in getting away from, let's say, capitalism and et cetera and returning to something kind of more in touch with nature, etc. And I think indigenous customs that are framed as part of that. Um, there was a campus folk movement, for example, in Taiwan, and just then you do have indigenous singer songwriters coming out of that. But then in more recent years, you see uh, acts such as boxing, hip hop, for example, or Outlet Drift, which is indie rock, um, or even uh, Jungi Sapor, who's uh, uh, Amis uh, as well, and is, is a DJ. So when we talk electronic music, or someone like Abao, the, uh, uh, who's also a kind of singer songwriter. Uh, some of her stuff is also kind of electronic ish, so it's more singing over that. Um, covered up. Can we, yeah. Can we do an Apau song, Brian? She's my, she's my girl. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the funny thing is, the past year, actually, there was actually comparatively less releases, which made uh, this, creating this was a bit of a challenge. I think it's because of the uh, six month break in which there was COVID basically from May until, let's say, October ish. So I think that interfered with a lot of release. Uh, comparatively, I did see less releases this year uh, compared to a lot of other years. So, yeah, this song, it's uh, Takudan with its collaboration with DJ DJ Long and Apao. Uh, it's interesting because this song is uh, another example of these kind of overlapping influences, for example. This is actually a version of a traditional song about kind of forbidden love between a news woman and a Han man. And so this is a modern day hip hop reinterpretation of that. And DJ Long, who is of course Han, plays the Han man. Apao plays the indigenous woman. Um, and so this kind of reversion of it is very interesting using, you know, contemporary melodies of, of taking traditional songs and putting them in a kind of a new form and is very contemporary. Um, I mean, the music video just is, uh, you know, just sort of like a fleeting counter. I feel like this is kind of a genre of Taiwanese music video, which is like, oh, boy meets girl, and they somehow just exchange glances and don't, nothing nothing more comes out of that. And that's a, such a common, you know, uh, trope of music videos. This is one of that, but I quite like it. I think the, uh, the interesting, is quite interesting combining these musical forms. Um, I mean, it is one of these songs that combines a more melodic, uh, for example, song, which is by Abba singing here with hip hop intertwined with that, which is Didi Long. Uh, Didi Long is also someone that, for example, sings in Tommy's Hokkien, um, or ra- raps in that. Um, we started off a little more kind of experimental, for example, doing uh, collecting sounds and then making music out of that, uh, sound samples, but then kind of drifted more towards hip hop, uh, and had mainstream appeal by really leveraging on this sense of Taiwaneseness. I think around like 2016, which in the years after the Sun Farm, things that really emphasized Taiwaneseness in music tended to be very popular. And so, you know, you have these bands such as Sorry Youth or um, you know, fire acts or, or et cetera, that kind of rose out of this, this, this environment or atmosphere as well.
我想要送给你上水的花，情话无法度藏在心内底，你爱知影，咱的缘分是天塌就注定好势，不是不是，像你讲的安尼。袂予你伤心，我是你唯一的选择，请你唔好顾虑遮多。沙巴初春正暖和，嘛有落雨落沙有花。嘛，侬比嘛出，嘛，侬比嘛出。唔知影啥物叫做甜嘛事，只知影为你痴迷，规个人忙事事。爸爸妈妈讲你好，你好，你的爸爸妈妈讲吃饭吃饭，我陪你一起回老家了解了解，和我亲爱的爸爸一样，我有梦给你的朋友，要去拜访的礼物，爱吃槟榔跟烧酒，啊对啦，煞袂记你爸爸是恁上辈也是我爸啦，我嘛会当穿越，管你管。I think you probably already. Unless, is there anything more you want to say about that song? I feel like you you gave it pretty good. Uh, not particularly. Yeah, but uh, something that was very cool is that Abba so, came to Taiwan and and collaborated with Yuyu Wan. So I was one of the people I reckon Abba <clears throat> that's someone I collaborated with, main to the production team. Yeah. So let's let's turn now to to Sonia Calico.、Mm. Yeah. So Sonia Calico is one of the up and coming and、uh, pretty known producers at this point in time in terms of the underground music scene, in Taipei, at Taiwan. Um, that's something I'm kind of connected to myself. I DJ, though not very much,、um, and so this is I tend to listen to a combination of indie rock and underground electronic music. And so Sonia Calico's out of the kind of milieu. I mean, she's been doing things for a while.、Um, for example, even in around 2014, there was a album、uh, of artists that were involved in the anti-nuclear movement.、Uh, that was one of the protests that was very big in the year before the Sunflower Movement, and there's a lot of youth participation. And so she has a song on there actually. That's something I play periodically. Uh, it's very different from what she's doing now, which is more kind of、uh, club music,、um, very strong kind of beats, etc.、Um, it's not the mainstream EDM kind of ish club. It's much more,、uh, let's say, alternative or independent or underground.、Uh, different sets of aesthetics here.、Uh, so I think this particular、uh, video is interesting as a、uh, kind of collaboration with a Korean artist.、So.
So, so Brian, you know, thinking about collaborations, sort of U.S. Taiwan, Japan Taiwan, Korea Taiwan, mm. uh, China Taiwan, Southeast Asia Taiwan. Wh where is the most activity, and what are the what are the trends? Mm. So that's actually part of why I chose this because it's quite interesting that you have a kind of underground artist collaborating with a Korean artist, because uh, that's actually what you see kind of most recently. I, for example, Murky Ghost, who's a rapper, a female rapper. Uh, was also collaborating with Korean artists. And suddenly there's a, a strong interest in Korean music in Taiwan. Um, I think just because it's in line with global trends. I mean, there's a lot of interest in Korean culture, whether that's with Squid Games or Parasite or have you, what have you, or, or Korean fashion, um, or, you know, groups such as BTS or Twice, et cetera. Um, but it's kind of interesting in that sense because Taiwan has such strong historical ties with Japan. And even though the song we listen to from uh, Collage, I mean, this Collage is a band that also is interested in these kind of Japanese influences. Um, but then in terms of actual collaborations, you don't see that as much, uh, for example, Taiwanese artists collaborating with Japanese artists. I kind of wonder what that is, actually. Um, considering that these ties between Korean artists, particularly from the kind of underground scene, and Taiwanese artists developed, particularly during COVID, actually. I think part of that is because, particularly in terms of uh, the genre of underground electronic music, Korea has a very developed scene. So I think reaching out to Taipei might not be out of the question in that sense. So Brian, speaking of cross-cultural things, uh, the the drama of uh, Wang Lai Home and his divorce, I think can we can fit in that bucket to make mm. a somewhat smooth transition. Um, what uh, w give folks who've never heard of this uh, news story a bit of a backgrounder, as well as uh, you know elucidate some of the broader societal issues which uh, the uh, the story and the treatment of it in the press has elucidated. Mm. Yeah, so Wally Hong, the Taiwanese American uh, superstar, came under scrutiny during his divorce to his wife, Di Jingwei, who's not a public figure. Uh, but then she alleged infidelity on the part of him a few days after their divorce. Uh, and just this history of sleeping with women, acting that way, still single, uh, sleeping with sex workers, etc. And this was posted on her Instagram. And so this went viral. Uh, this took place right before the voting on the national referendum. And so it suddenly just overshadowed the national referendum in the news, who was so focused on this. Uh, people are so focused on the drama between them in which one of them would post something and then the other would just fall on. Usually it would happen sometimes just like, you know, one goes to sleep and just suddenly will wake up in the dead of night and post something. And then just will have more content in the morning. And so people were kind of still churning over this. And it just went on for weeks and weeks and weeks as a dominant story. But it raises these issues regarding, uh, for example, abuse of women. That took place not too long after an incident in which a female legislator, for example, was beaten by her boyfriend. So even a very powerful woman in a position of political power could suffer abuse in this way, and that highlighted these issues. So there's a lot of concerns with how uh, women are treated by the media or focused in on by uh, entertainment gossip. Um, and so this highlighted a lot of those issues. But it just kind of takes more turns and twists as time goes on. And the latest thing I heard was that Wan Li Hong is like hanging out with the gangsters, and this was another element in their divorce um, that was as of yesterday. And so it's one of those things. I mean, it's fla fla uh, fodder for the tabloid media for sure, but. Uh, it's just interesting because particularly Wang Li Hong is someone that built up a credibility as a musician on the basis of being Taiwanese American for that. This, this cultural capital of being in the US. Uh, he's a number, one of a number of musicians for that period uh, that, that was like this. LA Boy is another. Uh, someone like DJ Jerry um, is another. Um, and so a lot of the kind of, you know, kids that are around my age grew up listening to this music and then suddenly watching their kind of idol just shatter and be taken down from that throne in front of their eyes. That's something I think people are quite focused on. And, uh give folks a sense of like how big he is in terms of, I mean, more, more salient than I think Justin Timberlake, which is like the closest <laughs> person I can come up with as like a somewhat squeaky clean, but also enormous male superstar. I don't, I don't know. What do you, do you think there's an analogy in the U S I'm not. Yeah. I think, sure. I think it's a good analogy. Yeah. And um, uh, the, the, the sort of dynamic of the parents getting into it as well. Good. We're not going to play what a Wang Lei home songs because he is a dirt bag. Um, but uh, let's turn instead to No Nonsense Collective. Uh, why do you, why do you choose, uh, choose this group? Yeah, so I think, uh, though, critically in terms of trends in Taiwanese indie music, uh, you have a kind, of, uh, you know, a kind of harder sound sometimes. I think this is represented by No Nonsense Collective. This isn't fully you know, heavy metal or not Freddie Lynn, the legislators, you know, death metal, etc. But it's a kind of harder rock sound. I think this is something that's quite appealing to a lot of people at this point.
So, so what about their politics is interesting. Yeah, so I think uh, it's interesting because a lot of the uh, bands I brought up, for example, a lot of their, uh, the way they kept known is actually very tied to politics. Uh, no nonce the collective, they're, uh, people are part of heavy metal bands, for example, and, and collectives of heavy metal bands that were involved in the Sunfire movement. They were actually, there's a group, the uh, I translate it as a kind of subaltern liberation area or Paria's liberation area, sort of splinter group from the main group in the legislature during the movement of artists, uh, heavy metal musicians, uh, people have more kind of politically radical leaders. And so they were kind of from that milieu or that environment. Um, and so a lot of these bands kind of just went through different lifetimes. Because I think the thing in, in Taiwanese bands is that they don't usually last more than two years. They disintegrate uh, because of all these factors I mentioned, or family or doing military service, uh, etc. But then the same musicians come back together in other forms, creating new group into, or bands down the line. And so No Nonce Collective comes out of that kind of uh, uh, milieu of like zine production, uh, they run a kind of uh, space, an alternative space, or let's say some cultural space, uh, somewhere in New Taipei, if I remember correctly. Um, they're part of a group that does this kind of annual uh, party, which is bands get together as well as DJs uh, in, in scene drawing, if I recall correctly. I have to know since the direction, so I don't remember I got there last time. Um, and just, you know, it's like a day long thing. And so they come out of this kind of more uh, countercultural uh, orientation, I guess you'd say, but they still found mainstream success in a way that really did surprise me. Uh, when they go on tour, it sold out very quickly. They play all the big venues, etc. I didn't really expect a band that was from this kind of background to actually become so successful. And that, that's quite interesting to me, actually. Brian, is there a right wing band we can highlight? What is right wing music? Uh, that's a good question. So I feel like the the indie rock scene or the indie scene in general, let's say, is pretty progressive. That's how I would describe its politics. Uh, no, not select is more far left, actually. I would say. Um, but you do have uh, Xiang Yu, the the tanky rapper. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I've, I've got it. I've fought with him on Twitter before, uh, more than once. Uh, he's on Twitter. Um, he's one of these people that does idealize China as uh, just a socialist utopia. And he's also quite fond of North Korea as well. He went to North Korea and filmed the video. Um, he's kind of an interesting character because I actually feel like that he could play actually a few years ago. And then, you know, he was still someone that people were like, oh, this politics is weird, but there's still room for him to play. I don't know necessarily if that's the case now. I feel like there's a political mood has shifted. Um, yeah, it's not to say this is good or bad or anything. Uh, yeah, he's an interesting character. Um, is there a, is there a song which you find tolerable? Not particularly, but I do find the one where he goes to North Korea quite, quite interesting. Cause it is actually a little uh, daring. I mean, to actually go to North Korea and sell music that potentially would have gotten in trouble. Um, but he does lay it on sure. a bit much with the kind of socialist realist aesthetics, uh, in terms of the, the MD. I don't, I don't know how people feel about that. <laughs> Yeah, the funny thing is that actually, I actually do feel that he has uh, gotten better over time, in the sense that his uh, yeah the, his skill has actually improved. I do think he's a much better songwriter than he is a performer himself. I mean, I recall seeing other people perform songs he had written. And I thought they were not actually too bad. So, despite fighting with him all the time, I do have some positive things to say about him. <laughs> Yo, Brett salutes ransom notes. This is for the people. Fuck the U.S. of America. Yeah, but 
，但其实是我们迷失于断章取义的历史，而第一世便其实被压迫的各国人民自以为仁义，却把压迫者奉若神明，不分明侵略和防御，只要求无条件的和平，得到奴隶主的肯定，不我不被他们尊敬。谁是朋友，谁是敌人，我们能否追究这问题而不自欺欺人？谁的盟友，谁的利润，是谁给予一份而争斗和牺牲？谁是朋友，谁是敌人？我们能否追究这问题而不自欺欺人？谁的盟友，谁的利润，是谁给予一份而争斗和牺牲？千金率最高的国家被当作自由象征，最常推翻民选政府的他被当作自由良朋，我们只有盲人，我想满称颂或贬是偏执，而不见是骗子掩饰，那现实别人饥饿，我们说是领导人无人性。却不记得制裁的目的是经过饿死人民破坏稳定，以迫使革命群众放弃革命。如果这不是恐怖主义，那么你的定义肯定有问题。我问你，唯一动用核武器的到底是谁？为何朝鲜发展核武就被认为是罪？谁的奴性思维被支配的颠倒是非？是我们把自卫视为威胁，把威胁视为慈悲？是谁不知不觉的在重复戈佩尔所起草的流言蜚语的同时，说别人被洗脑，并对用着坚如铁的毅力、英勇的旗驱逐侵略者的人民无理的怀有敌意？Brian, do you have a sense of like what a, I don't know, fifty-year-old like KMT supporter like what is their like sonic ecosystem? Yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, I guess they do listen to these kind of national anthems. Uh, that is something probably I don't know if they listen to it at home, but it's something that you know, inspires pride. Um, they also often do listen to older Chinese music, um, you know, like Teresa Tang, like that maybe, or also、uh, Taiwanese music from that period. Um, just I think a lot of it's quite retro. Um, and so it's it's kind of it's a、uh, it's it's one of those things. I think just sometimes,、uh, for example, I live in a very old neighborhood, and just my neighbors will just be blasting,、uh, you know, just like old Taiwanese song, etc. So I think that is is one of those things. They're kind of in a, in a bit of a time warp. But I think that what's also interesting is particularly entertainment or music that becomes an area of identity conversation between Taiwan and China, because China is so much larger than Taiwan. Just the music market is so much larger, and so entertainers such as Wang Lihong, for example, will go to China and make their living there, and that affects the views that they. Uh, espouse, and then there's concern from some people that the next generation of young people, for example, will grow up in an environment in which just it's dominated by Chinese music, television, film, and so they'll always be thinking of China, the, the greater China, as this bigger, better place because the production quality is usually higher. And so a lot of even the indie bands will be reluctant to voice their own political opinions, which generally do slant towards Taiwanese independence or at least you know being free of China in some form,、uh, because of the fact that they still tour in China, and so it's so difficult to make a living as a young person. Pretty good young person doing music, and so touring in China is a way to make more money to survive off of doing what you want to do. And so, so they're not as open about these views. I mean, sorry, youth is quite open about their views, so I think they're that.、Uh, but frankly, for example, no nonsense collectives.、Uh, they, because of their more left-wing stances, they will express solidarity, for example, with Chinese uh, groups. Uh, particularly, for example, with Wuhan affected by the coronavirus as the origin,、uh, they did a zine, if I recall correctly, just to kind of reach out because the punk scene is quite. Strong in Wuhan, so、uh, they they try to offer support or solidarity in that way. Yeah, sounds like a pretty tricky slash nigh impossible line to toe. Like, is there you know there was there was a moment in mainland. I don't know if you're the right person to ask this, but like you know there was a moment in mainland China where like Taiwanese music was seen as particularly cool and、mm-hmm. special and like you know forward.、Uh, and you know there was certainly a generation, you know Wang Lingholm.、Um, Uh, uh, included that like you know the 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 predominance of like mega stars on the mainland were actually Taiwanese, not from、mm. mainland China. Um, it seems like that is changing. Um, but I, I I'm I'm curious for your take on how uh sort of Taiwanese artists are starting to be um you know how how the reception of Taiwan Taiwanese artists on the mainland has has changed over time. Yeah, I think it's one of those things. I think that the,、uh, in the beginning, it does have to do with perception of Taiwan as an exotic other in China, you know, as a place that is different. And you can just trace that all the way back to Teresa Tech, for example,、um, etc. As this kind of forbidden musical idol that sings different styles, etc.、Uh, 
Uh, but then in, in, in the 1990s and 2000s, as, as Taiwan and China become more economically interlinked, I think that also plays into the economy. I mean, in terms, in terms of the economy and the music industry, particularly. For example, just in terms of the fact that a lot of factories were have Taiwanese owners and a lot of the capital is coming from Taiwan, then in terms of these more established artists going over to China and as, as having more capital or uh, clout, et cetera, I think that reflects the era of the things have changed now in terms of the relation between Taiwan and China economically, politically, and also culturally. And the cultural aspect reflects the other two in that sense. So I think you do have much more uh, Chinese artists, uh, Chinese artists that are known in Taiwan. Taiwan, think of itself as small. Uh, the entertainment industry is dwarfed by China. It is historical dramas, for example, of like ancient Chinese history. The ones that are produced in China now have much bigger budgets than the ones produced in Taiwan. And so they usually are of higher quality in that sense. And so that's something that's changed. We always have people talking about these variety shows, those Chinese variety shows that you have Taiwanese contestants going over uh, and uh, to participate in it. And just so it's, Taiwan is then framed as part of this reader uh, you know, network of provinces in which you have all these different yeah. talents and so forth. Uh, but once in a while, I have Taiwanese judge or, or what have you. Um, okay, next up we have Rainbow Chan. Yeah, so this is uh, quite different. This is also more reflective of my taste in that it is more kind of uh, underground, etc. There's a kind of pop melody, so Stanley. And this is not from Taiwan, but it's from Hong Kong in a sense. Uh, Rainbow Chan is Hong Kong, Australia. From Hong Kong, but grew up in Australia. <laughs>
So I find the song interesting particularly uh, because of concerns regarding Hong Kong and Taiwan in the past few years after the 2019 trip. So this is an album by Rainbow Chan uh, reflecting on the changes that Hong Kong has gone through from a position of diaspora uh, in the sense that the city has gone through so many changes and uses romantic love as a metaphor for that. And the songs on the album uh, are Stanley are a combination of Cantonese uh, in English and some Mandarin, if I recall correctly. And so I think it's uh, quite interesting, particularly because of the fact that Rainbow, when I interviewed her not too long ago, said that Taiwan was one of the bigger places which was interested in her music. And so I think what's quite interesting then is thinking about the role Taiwan has political, geopolitically, but also then regarding these larger events in the region, such as the protests in Hong Kong. After that, there's been a, a migration of Hong Kongers to Taiwan. You have a lot of Hong Kong restaurants opening up or bookstores or things like that. And you haven't really had musicians yet, but I think that this will affect uh, cultural production in the future. And I think that's interesting because we talked a bit about the uh, views of Taiwan in China, but thinking about the views of Taiwan in Hong Kong and the views of Hong Kong in Taiwan, it is quite interesting because I think what led to the sense of solidarity that one sees between Taiwanese and Hong Kongers in the past, let's say, decade is that they grew up consuming each other's culture. And so particularly back then, before the rise of China, uh, Taiwanese kind of music industry or film industry was more established and sent to China, but also Hong Kong. Hong Kong films were also quite established and you would have people in Taiwan watching Hong Kong films or listening to Fei Wong and things like that. And that kind of era has really faded, but I think people are still quite remembering of that. And I think that just then with the wave of Hong Kong migration to Taiwan, eventually this is going to have cultural effects, which I think we'll see down the line in the next, let's say, five to ten years. But I think this will be an interesting development to watch in terms of, uh, say, Taiwanese indie music or, or these various scenes. We'll have artists, for example, that are political in Hong Kong, perhaps not having the ability to stay there anymore and coming to Taiwan and perhaps bringing their talents here. And that will affect things, perhaps. Cool. Thanks so much for all this, Brian. Should we do a Teresa Tung, like, outro song? Sure, why not? <laughs> or... <laughs> all right, why don't you pick one? I don't know. I actually don't. I mean, the room wraps in my heart. That's, that's a positive. All right. Sounds good. Okay. That was so much fun. Tu 
月亮代表我的心。